this is Dolio, an original thriller fiction podcast presented in serialized format, a chapter at a time, written by Jared Canton, narrated by Joshua Canton, a Steady Chaos production, 2019. Previously, on Dolio. Paul, this is it. This is when you have to choose, I said. I don't have any choices left, he cried. Yes, you do. You can come back from this. Nobody is seriously injured. You don't have to ruin your life like this. Own your mistakes. Right your wrongs. Start with her. Let her go. He looked down at the top of Cindy's head, appeared to contemplate surrender, then swung his head back and forth wildly. No, no, I'm a dead man. Either now, here when I can control it, or in there. I imagined he was referencing prison. Hasn't Cindy suffered enough? You're not a bad guy, Paul, so let's not keep punishing her. Find your best self, let her go, do the right thing. Just then, when it felt as if the situation couldn't have grown any more intense, the large doors in the courtroom entry flew open, and armed officers filled the space shouting instructions at the visibly startled gunman. Freeze! Let's see those hands! He angled to shield himself from the cops with Cindy's body. She didn't resist, her hands bunched at the front of her face, covering tear-streaked cheeks that burned as red as smoldering iron. The defendant's bewildered gaze adjusted to face the police squad, and then back at me. Suddenly, he broke our stare, and his eyelids fell shut with a strange sense of finality, as if the book in his life had already closed, and only he knew it. No! I dug an elbow into Grant's back. He jolted right hard, tumbling over the prosecutor's table, and I broke towards Cindy. An explosion resonated through the courtroom like a nuclear bomb on my soul. With one squeeze of the trigger, one reaction of gunpowder and spark, the top half of Cindy's head disappeared. I reached Paul. The misty red residue of Cindy's life showered my skin like dew, and I threw a ferocious overhand right that landed square with the defendant's jaw as he turned the gun at himself. I heard and felt fractures, saw fragments of bone and skin and blood burst from his face, saw his neck snap hard right, then swing back left before his body just stopped and he teared back slowly against the juror's box, blanketing it, lifeless. I heard synchronized booms from the doorway, turned to witness as if one collective being, the officers continued firing in unison, like an old Civil War firing line, just faster, repeatedly, over and over. Saw the bullets bring the defendant's body back to life with jolts, and thrusts and blood and death. Heard the whiz of bullets too close, felt the gentle touch of wind, and I reacted scurrying along the floor to safety. The gunfire evolved, continued far too long, morphed into a muddled collage of deafening sounds. I looked up, saw as splinters and debris erupted around me, saw the defendant sag and then slump to the ground, blood pooling everywhere. Where his mouth had been was no more, just a twisted, broken face, pouring a continuous stream of blood. His chest was littered red, his shirt shredded. His arm somehow remained outright, and then it fell, and his gun clanked to the floor, discharging one final round. Cindy was dead, and for the second time in my relatively short life, I was pretty sure I'd been shot. The worst part, I fucking deserved it. Episode 12, New Beginnings It wasn't the first time I'd awoken that day, but the previous several times, I hadn't been able to muster a reason to stay awake. My first coherent thought each time was Cindy, most horrifically, what was left of her. The lifeless collapse of her body, the echoing gunshot throughout the courtroom, the agony on her father's face upon his coming to. It all made me wonder, what was truly left of the old me? Could the new me continue to put faith in people, in a system, in a world that constantly fucked the innocent, the better among us, whilst the worst dictated with fear and hatred? I had now, multiple times, chosen to bury that harsh realization with more sleep, in the hope that next time I'd awake, 
I'd realize it was all just a dream. But repeatedly, I'd awoken from brief half-sleeps to a harsh reality. Tragedy was stalking me. Maybe it stalked all of us. Maybe some of us were just more elusive. I clearly was not, and my life was descending into inexplicable chaos with each passing hour, and merely getting up to face each day was more challenging with each sunrise. I had genuinely, desperately, tried to sleep it away, but it merely afforded brief respite from the agony, from Dad's life of suffering, and James, Brett, and Cindy, but consciousness always brought the same conclusion. You can inhabit a world passively and take what comes, or you can make your own rules and attempt to forge your own reality. Even if in failure, taking control of one's fate at least offered the promise of chance, opportunity for control. I had lived waiting, I had let things happen around me, and it was clearly time for a new approach, because the old approach had failed dramatically. I scanned the room reluctantly. Even if I had chosen to wallow indefinitely, I'd have to get the hell out of here first. Bells, whistles, tubes, and needles all fit my expectations. The smell of cleaning agents, like a chlorinated swimming pool had fully evaporated into the air, fit my expectations. Even my dad, wheeled up to my bedside with nervous eyes trained upon hospital monitors he probably couldn't even decipher, was expected. What I did not expect was to be distracted from the brutality I had just witnessed by the doctor that parted the curtain separating my room from the hallway. She was tall, mid five foot plus range, with dirty blonde hair pulled tightly at the back of her head. I imagined it was long when released, when she found the time to allow herself some respite from all of this. Her cheekbones were pronounced, and their upper curvature nestled perfectly under blue eyes. They had a transparent glisten that I loved, almost as if I could see through her eyes, past the surface, three-dimensionally like peering into a marble. They were a hypnotizing shade, with just a hint of brown edging the pupil. She wore blue-green scrubs, carrying a two-stereotypical stethoscope and clipboard. The baggy outfit shrouded her shape in mystery, made her entire presentation enigmatic, like a small Christmas present housed inside a larger box, and then a smaller box, and another, until the shape of the final, true package was ultimately revealed. Mr. Daniels. She didn't look up from her clipboard as she said it. Here, I said coyly, raising my hand. The heart rate monitoring clip slid off my finger and skittered across the floor. The machine beeped, pronouncing me dead, which felt wildly appropriate in multiple ways. Dad looked at me with a sarcastic stare of disapproval. Smooth, counselor, she said, winking at my dad with a crooked grin. You were lucky, Mr. Daniels. Please, Ryder. I wasn't quite sure what normal conversation with a doctor sounded like. I'd had the same primary care doctor since I was young. He was now old, skin like tree bark, but I had never felt the need to make a switch, take all the tests over, restart the rapport, educate another doctor on a condition they almost certainly knew little about. Mr. Daniels, she repeated stubbornly, pausing for emphasis. The faintest grin appeared to betray her professional stoicism. Good news, the bolt didn't do any serious damage and we think we got it all. Just a pain in the ass? I cocooned my shattered heart with ill-fitting sarcasm. Dad's face twisted in discomfort at my second bad joke in as many minutes. Relentlessly consistent, I see. She fiddled with the IV bag dangling above my bed, leaning over and around my parked father. The bullet entered your buttocks, which, fortunately for you, were dense enough to prevent it from penetrating deeper towards your spine or upwards towards a vital organ. She smelled great, not overpowering, but feminine, clean. I breathed it in, encouraged it to wash clean the palate that was my current emotional state. Can I ask you a question? She looked down at the chart and continued without awaiting my response. The surgeon said you were adamant about not getting any anesthetics, not even a local, any particular reason. He has CIPA, Dad said. I waited for the typical response. Something between, I think I saw a documentary on that once, and you're a public accountant? Makes sense, she remarked. It does? Absolutely. I'm just a resident, but I've studied genetics extensively. It's a subspecialty, and your charts had me thinking CIPA. That's why I requested you. Hold on. 
So you're familiar with the condition? As much as anyone else, I guess. Not every day we get a cold fish in the air like you. She smiled, tapping the end of her pen to my 96 degree temperature reading on an adjacent monitor. They say operating on me is like wrestling the plastic wrap off a frozen dinner. She smiled, shrugged her concurrence. What else tipped you off? Well, your reaction to the prospect of surgery for one, it intimidates most people. People know that surgery hurts, or eventually will. People are predictable in that way. I can't say I blame them. You were just... different. I don't know any other way, I admitted. I get it, she said, and I believe she did. Beyond the obvious qualities that any man would find appealing was this instant connection I felt. Despite feeling deeply broken, she had already reached me, distracted me from the wallowing in memory effortlessly. It felt as if she could see through my facade, as if she understood not only what I didn't feel physically, but how that most certainly had shaped my life and the pains I could feel. I wouldn't have to explain the how, the why I was different in so many subtle ways. No need to hash out why I forgot my coat in January, or why I don't even notice. Why I grab sizzling dishes without flinching, burn my mouth on everything I eat, or run a temperature that a crocodile would be proud of. She already knew. She leaned forward and reached across my chest towards my hand. She squeezed the base of my thumb, and stared at the clock for a count I lost track of. I watched her face as she gazed upward at the wall, and then I glanced down awkwardly at her hand as it held mine. I wish I hadn't. Her left ring finger glistened like one of those cheesy crystals dangling from your grandmother's window, reflecting sunlight in all directions, an impressive medley of light and color. Her stone, however, was not as cheesy as it was blinding. It had to be two carats, at least, fastened to a whitish, silver metal that, based on the god of the diamond, was almost certainly platinum. She stretched further across my torso and untangled a wire opposite my bed. She flipped the wire hard, freeing it, and her sleeve shot up. A deep, thick, probably once red, now pale scar half-circled her inner forearm. She quickly fixed the sleeve over the scar, made eye contact briefly, and then looked away just in time to stand upright and roll the now untangled IV stand away from my bedside. Do you have a primary care doctor in Boston? I shook my head. Not really. Uh, not anyone. Momentary silence fell over the room, and an overwhelming wave of emotion washed back over me. The last week, I had been directly responsible for two deaths. I had seen a man stabbed, helped his attacker fall to his death, and coaxed a girl into a trial that would lead to her brutal death. I'd lied to a detective, witnessed an imaginary vigilante, and would likely go to jail for obstruction of justice, or worse, if James was dead and couldn't vouch for me. Do you want one? she asked. I said nothing, distracted, fought my way out of thought, back into the present. Uh, of course he would, Dad cut in. He reached forward and open palm slapped the back of my head as the doctor turned away. Uh, yeah, sure, I mumbled. Uh, who? Well, me, she said. Actually, uh, my supervising physician, but first, I have to ask you a favor. And that is, will you have dinner with me? Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed Dolio, please come back for future episodes arriving at regular intervals, and subscribe and rate us on your favorite podcast application. If you enjoyed this production, please visit the Steady Chaos Productions YouTube page and subscribe for more content from our production team.